Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, thank you all for being here. And I apologize that I can't give this lecture in Italian. Um, I, I could try giving it in Spanish, but that wouldn't help anybody. So uh, I think we're st oh yeah you. <laughs> so so, uh, so uh, I, I, I will I will do what I can to uh, to give it as clearly as possible. Um, Okay, so uh, I, I, I also apologize in advance. I'm not going to speak very much about uh, protocol here in 19, even though, in fact, we have worked on this for now a couple of years. We just don't have very many robust results, and I have learned to be very careful before I present uh, research data, especially to uh, families, because I don't want to mislead you. So instead, I'm going to give you an overview of the kind of work we've been doing, trying to understand uh, rare genetic uh, diseases and how they arise and trying to develop new treatments. Uh, so I am uh, at uh, the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research um, and I study autism and uh, I, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. I, I, I left, uh, I left, I left my, my uh, I left, I was born in Colombia in South America and I, I left home when I was 16 to go to the United States and ever since then, my mother has called me every week, sometimes twice a week. I, I am the most expensive uh, computer uh, advice person in the world. And, uh, I, uh, and so uh, every time she calls me, she says stuff. She's a lawyer. She doesn't really know much about biology. She doesn't really understand what I do very well. But she says, uh, occasionally, she says things that are surprisingly uh, profound. And uh, one of the things that she told me uh, the other day was she said, you know, I'm amazed, she knows that I work on autism, and she said, I'm amazed at how much progress you're making in autism. Every day you discover something else that causes it. Uh, which uh, is kind of damning by faint praise. We, we know about a lot of things that cause diseases, but we have not been so great at actually coming up with new treatments. Um, so our, our goal at, at Novartis is to uh, reduce uh, human suffering by, by treating neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative diseases. And, uh, and so uh, what I'm going to tell you about next is some of the approaches that we have been taking to trying to, to do this. Um, our, our, our very general strategy uh, is we, we, of course, want to work at this interface between an unmet medical need and a scientific opportunity. So there are many unmet medical needs, uh, but there are many that we can't address. Uh, and then there are some things we can address that are not unmet medical needs, but there's some interface between these two. And uh, at the sort of medical need part, we are interested in, in these neurodevelopmental, neuropsychiatric diseases, including epilepsy, and we're also interested in neurodegeneration, and that's, that's what we work on. And in terms of scientific opportunities, we have started with genetics because we want to start with patients. Uh, our goal really is to make life better with patients. It really, in, and this I should say comes as a surprise to many people, independently of the market size. Uh, we realize that if we can make something that makes a big difference for people, it is a business. Um, we are also interested in trying to understand circuits, and uh, I won't talk very much about our work there. Um, so, so, so my, my lab has, for, for many years, we've been working on autism and on the underlying cellular and molecular basis of autism spectrum disorders. And I just want to give you a little background on, on, on autism so that you know where we came from. Uh, we owe the original description of autism to these two men, Leo Kanner and Hans Asperger. They were two Austrian child psychiatrists who were working in the 1940s. And they're interesting in many ways, including the fact that they were Austrian child psychiatrists that worked on autism. Uh, but never talked to each other or cited each other's papers, which itself says a lot about science. Uh, and uh, in 1943, Leo Kanner wrote a famous paper in a journal called Nervous Child, and I should tell you they don't call journals this kind of stuff anymore. Uh, and he talked about a child called Donald, and he said of Donald, he seems self-satisfied and has no apparent affection when petted. He seems to almost draw into his shell and live within himself. And this describes one of the core deficits in autism, which is the social impairment. Uh, then he said, uh, words to him had a literal inflexible meaning. He seems unable to generalize. And this describes a communication impairment. And then he said, he wandered around making stereotype movements with his fingers. He spun with great pleasure anything he could seize upon to spin. 
And so this describes this restricted interest and compulsivity, which is characteristic of autism. And so I actually became interested in autism because I, I happened to have an autistic child. And so I was actually a, a sort of a, you know, I, I was interested in, in development in general before that, but I, I turned the direction of my research towards autism because I wanted to help my kids. Um, so this describes actually uh, three different disorders that I should just say, this has just recently changed um, with a new uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatry, but it describes essentially autism if you have all three disorders, uh, Asperger syndrome if you have social impairment and restricted interest and uh, repetitive behaviors, and something that used to be called PDDNOS, which is, stands for Pervasive Developmental Disorder Not Otherwise Specified, which is classical medical speak for nothingness. Uh, and it's uh, this communication impairment and restricted interest in repetitive behaviors. Now, this is what I thought autism was when I started, but it isn't really that. Uh, autism is this. It, it, it turns out that there are all these other symptoms that are associated with autism. And of course, there are a lot of comorbidities, and one of the major comorbidities is epilepsy. And so many of, our, of our, the kids that come to our clinic have, have epilepsy. Um, they also have other problems. They have anxiety. They have attention disorders. They have uh, mood and motivation. They have problems with sleep. If I could have slept, I, if if I could have slept a little more in my in my years as a parent, it would have been uh, you know better. Uh, and uh, so we are, are trying to address all of these diseases, and we realize uh, that there is uh, a, a lot of overlap between all these different neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, so what do we know about autism? So for a long time, people thought that autism was due to bad parenting. The original idea was that the, uh, the mothers were cold and unfeeling, and therefore the kids were strange. This did nothing for autism. This did nothing for anybody with autism. It did a lot of bad things to mothers. Uh, and it wasn't really until the 1970s when uh, Sir Michael Rudder first started looking at twins that uh, this feeling changed. And what he did is he looked at identical twins and he looked at non-identical twins. They, they, had, they share the same environment in the mom um, and he looked to see whether identical twins were concordant for autism. So if one of them had autism, what was the chance that the other one would have autism? And what he found was that uh, if they were identical, there was about a 90% chance that they would be concordant. If they were non-identical, the chance, in fact, in those studies was zero. We now know it to be about 10 or 15%. And so this told us right away that there probably is a genetic basis because you share all of your genes with your twin. Now, if you look at siblings, you only share 50% uh, of your genes with your siblings. And the concordance between siblings is only about 15%. Uh, and so we know from that that there is a genetic uh, susceptibility but that there is something funny about the genetics. So over the last 20 years or so, people have been trying to look for genes associated with autism, and it was mostly a failure until quite recently when it became possible to look for genetic changes on a genome-wide scale. And in doing this, we've identified a large number of autism genes, and there's something that's very interesting. The first thing is that there are just a lot of them. So this, these are all the chromosomes. And every place where you see a red thing or a blue thing, this is a region that has been implicated in autism. There's either a gene or there is a deletion or there's a duplication. Um, and we now think that there are somewhere between you know, 400 and maybe uh, 1,000 mutations associated with different kinds of autism. There are a couple of things that are interesting about this. The first is that the autism mutations are not penetrant. What does that mean? Well, it means that you might have the mutation, but you may not have autism. In fact, it's very likely that you will not have autism, you'll have some other disorder. And in fact, we know that there's a lot of overlap between genes that are associated with autism and those that are associated with inherited epilepsies, those that are associated with schizophrenia. And we don't understand why somebody, uh, two people with the same mutation sometimes develop one disease and sometimes they develop another disease. It may be, but this has led to a model, and the model is this. We're all different, right? And we're all different because our genes are a little bit different. And uh, that, the, that is our genetic background, right? That, that's, that's what makes me, you know, a short, dumpy Colombian guy, right? And uh, it turns out that superimposed on that, right, are these, uh, these, these, these bigger mutations, these what are called copy number variants, which are deletions and duplications, or these rare mutations. And those then, in turn, contribute to changing the uh, disease 
so that you then get something abnormal like autism. Okay, so the deal is we know that there's a genetic basis now. We know something about the behavior. The question is how do you make that link? And if you want to develop a treatment, you need to make that link because just knowing the mutation is great for diagnosis, but it doesn't really help you do very much uh, about the disorder. So conceptually, it's straightforward. We need to be able to link genes to the things that they affect, and they basically affect cells. And we need to uh, connect the cells to the circuits, and circuits ultimately change behavior. And so we're trying to work at both of those levels. But today, I'm going to tell you uh, mostly about the work we've been doing in, in cells. Now, how can you do this? So there are essentially, so the standard approach, the historic approach is you identified a mutation in humans and then you found an animal of some kind, a mouse or a fly or a worm or something, and you looked for the equivalent gene and you made that mutation in that gene in that organism because that allowed you to study it. And that uh, was, we've learned a lot from that approach actually. We've learned a lot about a lot of basic mechanisms. Uh, but, uh, and so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that approach for one disease we've worked on, and then I'll tell you why it sometimes is not optimal. Um, so, the, the, so you can, you can make a mouse, and this is what we've done. Uh, we've made a mouse model of one of, 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 in fact, many of these disorders, and I'll tell you uh, about a mouse model we made of this disorder. This is 16P11.2 deletion syndrome. Uh, these, these kids uh, have, uh, they, they all have some sort of a psychiatric uh, disease, so about 78% of them have what is called some diagnostic or statistical manual uh, diagnosis in psychiatry. Uh, only about 15% of, of them have autism. About 44% of them have a language disorder. 32% uh, of them have intellectual disability. 15% have ADHD. About 15% of them have uh, early onset epilepsy. About 64% of them are obese. And it is caused by a mutation in chromosome 16P11.2, uh, which happens to be a, a set of genes that is conserved on chromosome 7 in a mouse. So uh, a very talented uh, postdoctoral fellow in my lab, Thomas Portman, generated a mouse model of this. Uh, it was actually very complicated because it's a lot of genes and he had to target uh, this, the, this region. Uh, and he, he finally made a mouse uh, in which he could delete this region uh, in any specific tissue in the mouse that he wanted. And, and he, he made this mouse. And so I'm just gonna show you a little bit about this before I move on to the second part of my talk, which is about iPS cells. So, so one of the, the, the first things he, he did is he looked at the behavior of the mouse. I'm going to let you guess uh, which one is the mouse. These are sibling mice, but only one of them has a mutation. All the patients are heterozygous, and the mice are heterozygous as well, so they have the mutation in only one chromosome. And if you just look at them, so I'll let you guess which one you think is the one that's affected. So uh, this guy is, is, is affected, and he's, he's, pretty, he's pretty sick, uh, and uh, he, in fact, you can sort of measure this. You can, you can quantitate this, and you can see that uh, he rotates uh, dramatically over time. And this, this is interesting, and we've been working on trying to understand this, and I'll show you about one other phenotype, the behavioral phenotype that they have. But this, of course, provides some insight into the, the behavior. But the interesting thing is that uh, this, is, this is some sort of hyperactivity in the mouse. It turns out that most of the 16P11.2 kids are not hyperactive. Uh, so this is, gives you insight into the biology of the genes, but it doesn't necessarily give, tell you so much about the behavioral consequences of the mutation in a human. Um, the other thing to notice is that if you look, this is what individual mice look like. So every one of these dots is a single mouse, and these are wild types. These are the ones that are normal, and then these are the ones that have the mutation. And you can see that there are a whole bunch that are down here. There are a few that are up here, but there are a whole bunch that are down here. And it turns out that every generation, only about 20% of the mice have this profound circling problem. So all of these mice, unlike all of you, are genetically identical. We've inbred them. And so it seems that there is, in fact, some sort of a stochastic event, something that happens that we don't quite understand that is changing whether you get the disease or not. And this is both good news and bad news because it tells us there is something in the environment that is changing whether they get the, this, this kind of circling behavior. We don't know what it is, but we'll try and figure this out. Now, the other thing you can do, of course, is you can try and see if there are any kind of social behaviors, and many of these kids have autism, so we looked for social behaviors, and by and large, it seems that the social behaviors are fine, except for this one very interesting test. 
so uh, we, we were trying to develop assays for looking at social interactions in mice. And so we developed something called a social memory test. And uh, the way it works is as follows. This is our mouse here for the purposes of illustration. And uh, what we do is we present a mouse with a, a female mouse. And then we look to see if uh, the, female, the male mouse is excited and he's very excited. And we measure this by how long he spends interacting with the female. And then we wait 10 minutes and then we present the same female again. And it turns out that the, because the female is not novel, he is little, a little less excited. So we take the female out and we wait 10 minutes and he's less excited, and by about half an hour, he's not excited at all. And then we do as a control, we present the new female, and he's really excited again. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is the way the assay works. Uh, and uh, you can do this in a mouse. So, uh, so this, this is how it works. So we, we, this, is our, this is a wild type mouse. This is our 16P mouse. We introduce a, a mouse here, and you can see that he's very, very excited about the new mouse. We can do the same thing. And so is the 16P mouse. He's also very, very excited. So now we're going to jump to the fourth presentation. And so if you, if you do this in a, in a wild type mouse, he's, he's not that excited anymore. It's just not the same, right? But the 16P mouse, surprisingly, is still really, really, really excited. And so this is exactly the opposite of what we, what we expected. So in fact, these kids are autistic, but in this particular case, they, the, the mice actually just, just uh, they, they seem to, uh, they continue to interact, um, and uh, in fact, I, my graduate student uh, who was actually doing these experiments said that they were sort of like the perfect husband. Um, uh, so, so you can then do the control, and if you do the control, uh, you know, again, you can see this is a, a novel, this is the new mouse, and again, they're interacting uh, continuously. So you can measure this, right? And so you can look to see that what happens to the 16P mice. And so a wild type, over time, becomes less interested in the female, right? But the, uh, but the mutant uh, continues to be interested, uh, despite the fact that, in fact, they don't habituate. At first, we thought that this was exclusive to other mice, but then we did the control experiment. And the control experiment is to do exactly the same thing, but not do it with a mouse, instead do it with an object. And it turns out that if you do that, the result is even more dramatic. So, this is where you're presenting an object over time. So you're, every time, instead of presenting a mouse, you're presenting an object, a ball, say. So here we're presenting the ball, the same ball, and over time, the, the wild-type mouse it desensitizes. The mutant mouse actually becomes more interested in this object and stays interested over time. And so, um, and so what, this, what this tells you is that these mice don't, don't desensitize. They, they have this problem sort of recognizing novelty, essentially. They, they uh, remain interested in a particular object. They are sort of obsessed. And so that is a little bit similar to some autistic patients. But I, the point I want to make here is that while this is, gives us insight into what these genes do and gives us perhaps a place to test some new drugs, it is not exactly, in fact, it isn't really that much like the patients. So, uh, so mice are great, but they clearly have problems. And, and, and one of them is that, of course, we can just phenotype people much better than mice. We, we really understand humans quite well. We have a whole system dedicated to figuring out uh, the, how people behave. Uh, and we just don't understand that in mice. And our mice, they, they often, they just don't reflect the phenotypes that are associated with people. Um, the second problem is that, as I told you before, most of these diseases are multigenic. So you have this mutation, but then it's superimposed on a genetic background, and that matters. And we need to be able to replicate the genetic background that's associated with particular individuals. And we just can never do that in a mouse. And then the final problem, which is a subtle one, but some, one that we as biologists have been ignoring for, for really 50 years, is the fact that there are 60 million years of evolution that separate us from, from mice and rats. And as a consequence, our brains are really different. And there are parts of our brain that really do not have an equivalent in the mouse. And I would say that, for example, mice don't really have a medial prefrontal cortex, which is this thing, which is this gigantic piece of the brain, hardly exists in the mouse at all, right? And so, uh, so as a consequence, uh, it's, and we know that this is critically important for a lot of behaviors, including the onset of some epilepsy. So, so we need, to, we need to model something that is a little bit closer to the patients we're trying to treat. So how to do that? Well, you know, in neuroscience, we, we've, for a long time, we've had what I would describe as oncology envy, which is a bizarre thing to talk about. But, you know, in, in people who study cancer, 
Uh, we've made great strides, actually, in treating cancer. We don't have it cured, but you know, companies like Novartis are developing amazing new treatments. And part of the reason is that we had access to tumors. It turns out that you can take a piece of somebody's tumor, you can study it in the lab, you can use that to characterize the tumor, and you can use it to develop drugs. That is incredibly powerful. The problem is we could never do that in neuroscience. And we couldn't do it in neuroscience because we can't drill a hole into somebody's head and take some neurons out and then characterize them. That just that's not viable. Um, and so when I was thinking about how to study uh, this, these disorders in humans, I started thinking about well, whether we could get some biopsies. And at, the, at, at about that time, um, there was kind of a fantastic discovery. We used to think that development, brain development, was like spilling water. You know, you spill water, but you don't ever unspill water. It's a one-directional process uh, because, you know, it essentially accumulates disorganization. And we thought the development was like that, that, you know, when you start off with a, being a fertilized egg and then you become a human and and that's a one-directional process. It doesn't go backwards. And that turns out to be wrong. You can take a fully differentiated cell, like a skin cell or a blood cell, and it turns out that you can take these uh, genes, that you can introduce them into the nucleus, and it changes the way that the DNA is folded. And by doing that, you can convert a cell that is specialized to be a skin cell or a blood cell or an eye cell or a nose cell, and you can convert it into a stem cell. And that is a profound change because what that means is we can take skin cells which we can access or blood cells which we can access from somebody with for example a protocode here in 19 uh, mutation and we can then convert them into stem cells and we can take those stem cells and convert them into these little brain organoids and so the idea right is illustrated here so what we decided to do and this was about five or six years ago was to take this discovery, which was made by, I should say, by Shinya Yamanaka, who won a Nobel Prize last year for making that discovery. Uh, and we were going to harvest skin cells from patients, and we were going to convert them into stem cells, and we were going to take the stem cells and convert them into neurons, and then we were going to identify phenotypes in those neurons, and we are going to use that to develop new drugs. So I'm going to tell you about the progress we've made in trying to do that. It's taken a long time, but I think we're moving forward in a number of diseases. So, the first question, I should say, is, is how do you actually do this? I'm just going to take you through this very quickly because this is probably new to many of you. Uh, and so the idea is essentially this. We start out with cells that look like this. These are skin cells. We introduce these reprogramming factors uh, into the cells. We can do this with viruses or we can do this with these things called uh, episomal vectors. We can then, uh, the, if you wait long enough, the cells become cells that look like this. We can now do this in, in less than a week. So we can start uh, in, in a week, we can actually generate these, these iPS cells. We can do it with essentially 100% effectiveness from anybody, okay? We can then, uh, we have a whole series of quality control and standard operating practices. So we can now do this for hundreds of people. Uh, this, are, this, this, for example, tells you that these cells are really are stem cells because they produce the proteins that are characteristic of stem cells. Uh, this is a gene, this is the analysis of a gene expression array. The only thing you need to see is that these are human embryonic stem cells. These are the cells that we're making. They're called iPS cells for induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, and they're very different from neurons or progenitors or fibroblasts in their gene expression. And we and other people have worked on trying to figure out how to make really good ones and we can make really good ones. So the next question is, can you convert these stem cells into neurons? And, and uh, the answer is yes. Here we really are, like in most of science, sitting or standing on the shoulders of giants. People have worked on this for a long time, since the time of Sperry, who, who won a Nobel Prize for uh, identifying the uh, organizing center. Uh, we, we have known that there are these morphogen gradients here, these growth factors that determine the function of a developing cell. And so we can uh, start with what is effectively a, a stem cell, which is the very earliest cell that has the capacity to be any other cell, and then we can withdraw a growth factor and we can convert these cells into these little Little, called, little things called embryoid bodies which have three germ layers. And we can take these things and then culture them so that they make these circular structures called rosettes, which are very much like the cross section of a neural tube, which is a very early stage in the development of the, of the brain. And then we can take these things and culture them so they start making these little balls. And these little balls look a lot like little brains. And we know they look a lot like little brains because we can cut them down the middle and we can see that they have progenitor cells and these are the green cells here that are stained with an antibody. They have little born neurons. And if we wait long enough, they actually have 
uh, they, they become these elaborate networks that look for all the world like the cells that you would get from a brain. And, uh, and so you can sort of see uh, what this actually looks like. Uh, if I were to show you just the same stain from cells that I had taken from a brain, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Um, we've worked a lot on trying to characterize these cells, and it's been very important to us. You know, in, in, in our business, we have to make absolutely sure that everything we do is really, really robust. And uh, so we developed ways of trying to figure out the classes of cells that we were making. One approach, for example, is illustrated here. Uh, we developed a method that allows us to take a single cell and look at the expression of the production of a lot of genes in that cell as a way of trying to figure out the kind of neuron that we're making. Because we have a lot of different sorts of neurons in the brain, we want to know that we're making the right ones. And so every, every cell now, each one of these, each, each row here is a different cell. Each bar is a different gene, and there's a barcode, and the barcode tells us what class of cell we have, and we can tell you at this age in development, which is about two months, half of the cells are still, pro are, are still progenitors, so they're not neurons yet. This is what a child is like, right? A lot of progenitor cells. The other half are neurons, they're, they're young neurons. Uh, they express a lot of the kinds of receptors and ion channels that we have drugs for. Uh, they even have markers that allows to determine what layer of the brain they're from. So you know our cortex has different layers, right? There are six layers. It turns out that the cells in different parts of the cortex have different specific proteins, and we can figure out uh, whether we have a lower layer or an upper layer neuron. At this time in development, we mostly have lower layer cells because this is early in development. Um, we can also try and figure out if these cells are actually functional by putting calcium dyes inside them. So changes in calcium happen with electrical activity. And uh, you can see that these cells, when stimulated electrically, will fire these electrical impulses. This is kind of the way in which neurons do stuff. Uh, we can even put, uh, we can even label these cells so that they can, we can recognize a specific class of neuron. And then we can go with an electrode and measure the electrical potentials. You can show that they actually fire these action potentials here. Uh, you can even see that they form these connections. These are critical connections. They're called synapses, and they're uh, centrally important for our understanding of many uh, diseases in the brain. Um, this is just simply to show you that, in fact, if you look at all the cells, different cells do different things because they're at different stages in, in development. Um, so the final thing is we can actually put some of these human cells back into a mouse. And why would you want to do this? We're not interested in making mice that you know think or anything like that, and we wouldn't be able to. But what you can do is you can take a few of these cells and you can look at them in the context of a brain. And that's valuable in and of itself because it gives us a better model for trying to develop new treatments. Um, so the final question is can we identify any phenotypes? And if we do, can we come up with any sorts of treatments? So I'm going to give you, again, two examples from two different syndromes. One of them is uh, called Timothy syndrome. And Timothy syndrome is uh, a, a disorder that is associated with this webbing of the fingers and toes, syndactyly. It's also associated with hypoglycemia, so these severe falls in blood sugar, uh, autism in some fraction of the kids, and then this uh, cardiac arrhythmia. And it was identified by a guy at Novartis called Mark Keating, uh, who, I, who had a very astute clinical uh, nurse called Kathy Timothy, who I noticed that there, these, these patients were all different and they sequenced a bunch of genes and they discovered uh, one of the mutations. And it turns out to be a mutation in this, this protein that forms an ion channel, which is uh, a protein at the membrane that controls the uh, electrical activity of a neuron. And this mutation changes the properties of this, of this ion channel. So uh, this, is, this is a recording of the ion channel and we can record current going into the cell and the cell uh, the current is going in here, and then the ion channel is closing over time. This is a, a property of almost every ion channel, this kind of decline in current. And you can see that the point mutation changes the way in which the current works. So now, instead of closing, it stays open. And uh, this is uh, something that happens in only one copy of the channel, uh, and so we want to understand why it leads to disease. So we've done, we, the next step is to make some neurons from these kids and try and identify the phenotypes. And we've identified a number of phenotypes and some of them we identified based on what we knew, we thought we knew about the gene from other systems. So one of the things that we know that this gene does is it regulates the development of these, uh, of, the, of, of neurons and it uh, regulates the shape of the cells. And so uh, 
you, uh, we developed an assay that lets us actually watch how cells develop in the lab as a function of time. We, we make these movies in which we, you, a lot of things are happening here, like there's a cell that's migrating, but if you look at this cell, for example, it's extending and it's retracting, it's dendrites. This is over the course of nine hours and the movie's playing r over and over and over, right? And um, if you, uh, and, and, and so what's happening is that every time that we illuminate, so I should just say, we put, we introduce into these cells this light activated ion channel from, uh, from this algae. And every time we illuminate them, they fire these action potentials. And every time this happens, the, the calcium goes into the cell and uh, it changes some sort of a signaling cascade that we don't fully understand. So we looked to see if there was a difference between patient cells and control cells. And, uh, and so what you, what you can see is that the control cells extend their arbors as a function of time, but the, but the patient cells gradually start retracting their dendritic arbor. And we've done a lot of work to understand what is actually going on, and so we've identified some of the signaling cascades downstream. We know, for example, that this depends on the activity, the, the uh, what is called the ectopic activity of a particular kind of small rho GTPase uh, and, uh, and a, a set of adapters called uh, the RGK proteins. Um, the other thing we've been able to do is we've been able to use the system as a way of screening for new drugs. So uh, this are control cells. These are the mutant cells. We looked for drugs that would be able to rescue uh, this, this defect in the cells, and uh, we screened many, many drugs. We didn't get very many hits. Uh, we got a few hits here. This one, for example, is one that I can tell you about because it's already published. Uh, it's something called Roscovitin, and we looked a little bit about how, at how it works, and it turns out what it does is it binds to this mutant ion channel, and it actually reverses the molecular defect. It actually causes this channel to now close uh, at this time when it's supposed to close. So it's interesting because, in fact, this is not what this drug was ever made for. It was made because people thought it was going to be a good anti-cancer drug. Um, so uh, there are other ways in which you can try and figure out what's wrong with these cells, and this gives you insight into what might be useful for patients. So one of the things we did is we looked at the changes in genes in cells from, these, from kids with Timothy syndrome, and we identified a whole bunch of genes. And when we did that, uh, we found that, in fact, there was a subset of genes here that are associated with the production of catecholamines, right? And these are things like norepinephrine and dopamine, and so, uh, in fact, there's excess production of catecholamines in these kids. And we verified this by actually staining for tyrosine hydroxylase, which is this enzyme that determines whether you make norepinephrine or dopamine. And so uh, these cells now have excess amounts of uh, tyrosine hydroxylase uh, compared to controls. Not only that, it's true for every Timothy patient. And furthermore, not only do they produce the enzyme, they actually produce excess amounts of norepinephrine or dopamine. And so this has led to a change in clinical practice. So now we give these kids beta blockers because we have ways of blocking the activity of this hormone. Okay? So the final thing is we look to see if this excess amount of norepinephrine that the kids were producing was reversible in, in, in our cells. And it turns out that it is because you can treat the cells with roscovitin and this actually changes uh, the fraction of cells that produce tyrosine hydroxylase. This is really useful because it tells us there are some aspects of what people used to think was an intractable developmental disease that is actually treatable with a drug, right? Okay, so uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going rather slowly, so I'm going to try and, and speed up for the last few slides here, but uh, I just want to summarize what I told you. Uh, so we can now make these uh, uh, cortical neurons uh, from kids with neuro neurodevelopmental diseases. These neurons are functional, they fire action potentials, uh, the, the cells from kids with Timothy syndrome show this excess dendritic retraction, which can be rescued by, by a small molecule. They also show an excess production of catecholamines, and we can use them to, uh, to screen for new compounds. Um, so I'm going to just finish by telling you about another disease we've worked on called Philip McDermott syndrome. And this is a disorder associated with neonatal hypotonia, global developmental delay, and absent or severely delayed speech. And it is caused by a deletion of chromosome 22Q13, which is, uh, encompasses many, many genes, including a gene that is thought to be important for the formation of synapses called Shank3. And Shank3 is important because it's this key scaffolding protein at the post-synapse. And uh, 
Because we thought that synaptic transmission was going to be important, we developed a system that allowed us to measure synaptic transmission in these cells. Uh, we compared cells from, uh, so what we did is we, we took cells from patients and cells from uh, kids that didn't have the mutation, and we put them in the same dish, and we compared their properties electrically. And so, uh, so what we found is that, in fact, these, the cells from these kids have much, much smaller synaptic transmission. So, you know, cells make connections with each other. Those connections are called synapses. This is the way information is transferred. And it turned out that there is a severe defect in synaptic transmission in these kids, which you can see here. Uh, this is quantified here, but you can basically ignore this. Just focus on this. There, there's a very, very severe uh, defect, especially early on. Um, it turns out that this is actually due to loss of shank 3. This is an important thing to establish because these kids tend to be missing tens of genes, sometimes hundreds of genes. And you can introduce the shank 3 protein into the cells and you can actually rescue the synaptics. You remember it was really tiny, now it's really big. And you can rescue it in almost all of the patients. Um, you, we then did a, we looked then for agents that might be able to, so you know, we can't very easily introduce shank 3 back into the brains of these kids. But what we can do is try some small molecule or a growth factor. We tested a few growth factors that uh, were part of this thing called our secret home. Um, and uh, one of the ones that rescued is this uh, growth factor called insulin-like growth factor 1. And it turns out that we could actually rescue synaptic release uh, using this insulin-like growth factor one, and you can see how that's happening here. Okay, so this is interesting because this has now led to a clinical trial on insulin-like growth factor one. Now, we're working on better versions of it. Uh, we know that it's not a very good drug, but the foundation was very interested in pushing this forward. Um, we know a little bit about how uh, insulin-like growth factor one works. We first thought that it might rescue by restoring shank three expression in kids. That turns out not to be true. Uh, so here you can see shank 3 levels under control conditions. When you treat with IGF-1, the red stain goes away completely, but the green stain goes up. The green stain is a stain for new synapses. So, so, so for some reason, this IGF protein, this insulin-like growth factor, causes a loss of shank 3, but an increase in the number of synapses. We don't exactly understand how that works. Um, but we have noticed that uh, this is because there is something fundamentally different about human neurons. Um, it used to be thought that every green, every, every synapse that had this green spot ha also had a red one. Every synapse had shank three. And it turns out that that's definitely true in rats, but it's not true in humans. So in humans, there are many, many of these green spots have no red spot, many red spots have no green spot. This is true also in the brain. Uh, and so, uh, so what you can see here is that, in fact, there, we make insights by studying human cells that we would just never be able to make if we had a model mouse system. So um, we have a model for how we think insulin works. I, I, I'll go through this just very quickly. What we think is that, in fact, shank 3 is required for these early born synapses uh, and that IGF-1 causes a transition from these synapses that have shank 3 to synapses that don't have shank 3 but have another protein called PSD95. And uh, in patients, uh, IGF-1 actually causes, uh, allows you to bypass this shank-3 step, by, perhaps by uh, accelerating development. So in a sense, uh, the patients, the Philip McDermott patients, have, uh, have, have a kind of impaired, uh, an impaired developmental uh, synaptic maturation. Um, so just to summarize then, uh, Philip McDermott patients have a defect in synaptic transmission the defects uh, are due to loss of shank 3. They can be restored by IGF-1. Uh, and this happens because it converts cells that have shank, uh, synapses that have shank 3 into ones that now have this new synaptic protein called PSD95. So where are we now? I would say in some ways we've made huge progress. Look, when I started, we knew virtually nothing about autism. Right? We didn't actually know most of the genes. There had no mouse models. We had no human models. We had no anything. What we knew was that there was a genetic basis and that the thought was you couldn't do much about it beyond perhaps education and symptomatic treatment. Um, I think we've made some progress. We can make neurons from kids with autism. Right? We can make mouse models. We can identify defects in these neurons. We can identify compounds that reverse these defects in the lab. And that's really important because that's how we make progress. Um, and so that's the good news. But we're still not there. Uh, and what are the issues? 
So first of all, the human neurons that we make are still not mature. So this is great for development. This actually is great for early onset epilepsy. It's not so great for, you know, Alzheimer's, but we're still working on that. Um, and the second problem is that we can identify defects, but to actually make sure that that defect actually causes a disease in the brain of a patient, that's not trivial. And so one of our biggest problems in the pharmaceutical industry is to come up with really well-validated preclinical assays. Because once we have that, we're actually really good chemists, right? We, we, we're, we're great at making molecules, but we sometimes make molecules against targets that don't matter. So we need to figure out how to do that better. So let me just finish by thanking all the people who made this possible. First of all, none of this would be possible without the families. So the people who've come to our clinic uh, are, have been, uh, you know, essential for all of our work. Um, this is, this is our, 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 our team at Stanford, and many of these people have now moved to Novartis. I just want to point a few of them out because they're important to what you've heard. Uh, Alex Shaglotevov was our, the, the person who worked primarily on Philip McDermott syndrome. Uh, Jocelyn Cray and Sergio Pashka worked on Timothy syndrome. Uh, uh, Thomas Portman developed a 16P mouse. And Masayuki Yazawa helped us develop the IPS protocols. Uh, and of course, we have many great collaborators, academic and otherwise, and this is some of them. And with that, I will take your questions. Thank you very much. So you treated your IPS cells with um, roscovitin, and you get great results, and you treated them while they were developing. Yes. Do you think that this uh, can be translated um, <clears throat> uh, on uh, uh, the therapy on humans after the embryonic development or um, the treatment should be done while the embryo is developing? Well, we're, yeah, we, we don't think we can treat anybody as an embryo. Uh, we, we are interested in treatments that are effective in children, right? So we have tried to optimize the conditions so that the cells look sort of like they would after birth. But they're still developing because, of course, development in humans takes 20 years. So, um, so the hope is that uh, we can reverse things, uh, you know, post-embryonically. It, it's, it's actually really difficult to determine at precisely when, precisely when the treatment would be effective, uh, just simply because uh, the mouse actually doesn't model that very well. The mouse, I should say, the Timothy mouse, for example, mm -hmm. doesn't have Timothy syndrome. It doesn't even have a cardiac arrhythmia, actually. So, um, so we can't really do that. But so we can make the best we can do is try to make uh, human these brain organoids and uh, uh, accelerate their maturation in vitro, and then see whether we can reverse the defect. Uh, at that point. Uh, but of course, as, as, as people interested in, in, in therapy, we, we very much want to make sure that it, 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 we work on things that we believe are reversible. And I, I mean, this is, I should say, goes counter to most of the pharmaceutical industry, but we really think that some of these developmental disorders are tractable because we believe that development in humans occurs after, a lot of it occurs after birth, so. Thank you. I would like to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, you showed the methodology of, uh, in some way, of growing up uh, differentiated cells from IPS and then uh, transplanting them back to the uh, mouse brain. Now, the, the, the reason for this is to increase synapto uh, synaptogenesis, uh, increase, uh, um, accelerate development of, of these cells. Uh, no, so that... It, or you have to do it, or you, the, you utilize this for... a you know, selective experiments or what yeah. or it would be a general methodology that you would suggest and so on? So I, I wouldn't, it's a very slow, painful process. Uh, we mostly did it because we wanted to be able to study the cells in the context of a circuit that we understood. And when you make cells in a dish, you don't have any circuit. You just simply have cells that are connected to their neighbors. So, um, so that was the main idea. It turns out we were hoping that it would increase maturation. And in some ways it does because you can keep the cells longer. Uh, but it's, there is an intrinsic program in humans that delays the development of neurons. So we have a much bigger brain than a mouse. And one of the reasons is that our cells go through many more divisions, at least five or six more divisions, before they actually differentiate. And then it takes them a long time to differentiate. And a lot of that seems to be intrinsic. It's not something that uh, 
it's it's sort of an intrinsic part of the of the program. So we've done those experiments mostly as a proof of principle that we can uh, actually use it as a way of studying, uh, uh, as, as as a way of studying the cells in a more sort of native context. Thank you. 